Hello and welcome to this uh, very special edition on ET Now. Let me welcome on board on the sidelines of the Morgan Stanley India Investment Forum, Jonathan Garner, the Chief Asia Emerging Market Equity Strategist at Morgan Stanley, joining you on the show right now. Jonathan, hi, morning or rather afternoon almost. Uh, welcome to ET Now. Tell me, what's the mood Good about morning. India now that, you know, it's well established, there's political stability, not just at the helm, but also various cabinet ministries. Yes, indeed. So I arrived in India about 48 hours ago, so I was following all the sort of ministerial appointments with a lot of interest. Uh, the conference is very well attended. And I think when you look at the performance of the Indian market, really the last two weeks or so, it's, it's quite encouraging. I know we had sort of volatility on the election results day itself, but what you're starting to see is India resuming its outperformance, uh, particularly of uh, China, and it remains our largest overweight in emerging markets. Right. But Jonathan, tell me, you know, despite all the positives and not just now at the political uh, political front, but even if you look at the macroeconomics, be it the GDP growth, be it the tax collections, all of it, why, are, why is the FII and the FBI fraternity still sort of escaping India up until now? I mean, they're back, but just sporadically. Yes, there have been sort of moderate, I would say, outflows this year. Uh, one does have to bear in mind there are other thematics that are very strong in Asian investment right now. So we are also bullish on Japan, a very different sort of story. It's really an ROE recovery story in Japan. But that has attracted very large foreign institutional investor flows. And of course, we have the AI thematic, which is highly investable in Japan, Taiwan and Korea. I, don't, I wouldn't read too much into the fact that FII flows are moderately negative. Uh, I think the support from the domestic investor is important in India, but we're also likely to get structural upweighting in India by truly global funds over the next couple of years, now that India's weight in the EM index and global equities has risen so much. Uh, it's really quite a dramatic increase in weight. So those truly global investors are likely to be coming to India and buying you know, their first or second stock over the next couple of years. Jonathan, when it comes to India, is valuation also a concern? Yes, yeah, so if you look at the outflows that you mentioned, that's more from the, the traditional emerging market Asia X Japan investor. Uh, and indeed, if you are a value investor, you, you would have a problem with the multiple that the market's trading on. But the point we make is that the growth multiple, i.e. around 22 times forward PE from SCI India, is fully justified by superior earnings per share growth. Um, MSCI India's dollar EPS has compounded 60 percentage points faster than overall EM in the last uh, three years. So the farther out you look in terms of that forward multiple, the more, of course, it drops away. And we're really going through an unprecedented period of Indian earnings growth relative to, for example, China, where earnings have actually fallen in the last three years. So, you know, that's the way that one can frame the debate. Other than Japan, you know, Jonathan, and you did allude to China a couple of times, the conjecture is also that money is moving to markets like China as opposed to India because of the stark underperformance, the, you know, valuation being attractive right now because they've not done anything for the last three years. They haven't even come off from the COVID lows. Uh, do you also sense there is the China threat to flows uh, coming into India? Um, in short, not at all. Um, there was a counter trend rally in China in April, but that's run out of steam quite badly in the last two or three weeks as the negative fundamentals have reasserted themselves. So that's nominal GDP growth that's running at only around a third of the level of India, uh, a currency that is uh, more susceptible to weakness than what you see in the case of the Indian rupee. And, and over sort of everything, we have the sort of the deflation of the property bubble in China, which is what's depressing uh, corporate earnings. So uh, yes, positioning was extremely negative on China in, let's say, mid-March. We had a counter-trend rally. Um, it's important to notice also that the beta or the volatility of the China market is systematically increasing as the fundamentals have weakened, whereas the volatility of the Indian market, if you just take aside the election day itself, which is obviously a unique event, the election results announcement, but in general, the beta of the Indian market has reduced, 
which is the characteristic of a secular bull market. So what we think is happening here in the last two weeks is that the secular bull trend in India is significantly reasserting itself, whereas the bear trend in China is, is again, uh, pushing that market down. When it comes to India, Jonathan, you know, while you've established that it is your biggest overweight within the emerging market basket, but what would make you, uh, you know, be a sustainable bull in India? And I'm not talking about short term. Let's talk about two to five years hence, now that the political stability is well established. Well, we have been bullish for a considerable time, um, most of the last three years. And we made a formal statement in our year ahead outlook that India would likely outperform again uh, this year. Uh, I've talked uh, quite a bit about China, but do bear in mind that we've also recently downgraded Mexico and also Indonesia. I won't go into the details, but if you look at the elections that have taken place recently, the sort of the, the stability in India, uh, the fact that the core institutions that are so important for investors, so the court system, uh, the independence of the central bank, um, that these are very much intact is something that's likely to, again, keep investors focused on this market. Sure. That really brings me to what is investable in India? Because, you know, what all the domestic money has done is run up some of the small and mid, -ca mid caps or smiths, as we call it now, uh, a little ahead of their valuations. You know, we were just stacking up how much the market has recovered at just an index level from the Tuesday lows, which is just about a week from now when the election result was announced and, you know, the index tanked all, all across and so did individual names. We're already up almost 20% on the small cap index alone, 15% on the mid cap and 10% on the nifty too. So where is it that you do see investable opportunity when it comes to India? Well, for our clients, they're inherently more interested in, in big cap um, because they obviously have a lot of money to deploy and they need that liquidity. So we like financials, uh, consumer discretionary, industrials, and also real estate, where the market cap is maybe not so large. So some of the names that we recommend include ICICI Bank, uh, Maruti Suzuki, uh, Godrej on the real estate side. Um, there's quite a broad array that you could invest in, but the key theme is really to go for the domestic demand plays uh, across, across the piece, really, in, in, in India. Sure, that makes sense. And these are some of the blue, chi blue chips of the blue chips within the sectors that you just talked about. That's ICSA Bank, Maruti, as well as Godrej Properties. The other debate in the market, um, Jonathan, off late has also been whether to stick with the PSEs, that's the public sector undertakings or not, because, they, again, you know, they've run their course. Themes like railways, defense, etc. You've got the oil and gas uh, a theme as well coming up right now. Uh, there's a huge mm. thrust on power as well because of the increasing demand, um, because of the data centers as well, you know, coming up in large sums here in India. What is your overall thesis yes. on whether the government-owned companies are to be owned when it comes to India, if you want to play the story for the next five to ten years? Yes, I would highlight uh, two areas. I, I won't go into stock specifics, but the, but the defence sector is certainly one that we've recommended exposure to uh, in the past. We don't currently have it in the portfolio, but it's part of the overall what we call multipolar world thematic. And it's actually a sector that's playable, not just here in India, but in Korea and Japan as well, where we also recommend those kinds of names. And then, yes, we've done a lot of work about the power needs of AI, and, of course, India has a multiplicity of needs for additional power as it goes through this rapid phase of economic development. And so the right kind of power utility names make sense in India. And again, that's a thematic we've been writing a lot about recently. And there's ways to play that elsewhere in Asia, including actually in particular in Malaysia. The other emerging theme in the market here in India, and, you know, clearly the government's thrust also seems to be in that direction, Jonathan, is the renewable energy sector. Um, I mean, we all know that that's the need of the hour and that's where the globe has to head eventually. But do you think India can play a major part? And are there enough investable opportunities when it comes to the renewable energy sector and even the derivatives that come out of it?
Yes, I mean, that's a sector that is clearly of crucial importance globally. But the, I think there is a, a small caveat here that a, a lot of the equipment supply that goes into that globally is uh, dominated by China. If you think about solar or wind or EV batteries and the whole EV supply chain, uh, and that's where um, China is very successful. But you are getting this multipolar world dynamic where other countries are becoming concerned about reliance on Chinese technology um, as they try and make that transition. So that's something that the, uh, the Indian government is going to have to think about. Jonathan, in your pitch for Japan, you talked about some of the AI companies. I know India has traditionally been sort of the, uh, you know, cloud kitchen for IT services here in India. Some of the companies definitely are sort of, you know, changing their skin and now talking about AI. Many of the service providers are getting into their own AI platforms and what have you. But do you really think India can make, it ma make its mark when it comes to AI? And, you know, can that be an investable theme then? That's one of the things I want to find more uh, about as I uh, visit India on this trip, because there is a, a definitely an investor debate about that. There are some people who think that particularly for the lower end of IT service outsourcing, so basic code writing or data manipulation spreadsheets, uh, basic call center work, that this will be quite disruptive. And it's a sector where India has been highly competitive in the past. Uh, but it's uh, certainly at the moment the companies are guiding quite positively on the effect this is having on their revenues in the implementation phase as this build out takes place. But it, it isn't at this point clear to me where this lands longer term as either a positive or a negative. We haven't actually made our mind up on that yet. Sure. Jonathan, what could be the risk to the India bull case? I mean, do you see any risks at all? Well, I've just arrived uh, here in Mumbai and the monsoon rains have arrived. It was uh, extremely uh, hot and difficult conditions here in recent weeks in India. And I do think that climate change is important and potentially can undermine some of the economic momentum that exists. And uh, India does have challenges. It's not unique in our coverage in, in that regard. Parts of the southern, southern Africa and certainly in Asia are, are suffering as well. There's been unprecedented heat in Southeast Asia also over the last couple of months. So I would highlight that um, as, a, as a really quite a pressing issue at the moment. Uh, I think some of the traditional issues around, let's say, oil import bill uh, and, and that sort of thing, or vulnerability to Fed cycles, they've been much diminished now that the current and capital account situation in India is so much stronger. Essentially, the overall balance of payments is in surplus in India now. And that's why the currency has been so much more stable in, than in the past over this recent Fed cycle. So, so that one is probably less important, but the climate change thing is, is of some significance. Yeah, it is. And since you did talk about rains, I'm sure you must have uh, maybe perhaps traveled already on some of the new bridges that at least the city of Mumbai has had. What is it that you're making of the infrastructure transition that we're seeing almost on a monthly basis here? Well, I've been coming to India for a long time now. And yes, it's interesting just coming to the conference. Um, it, it, uh, when I was traveling in, uh, my driver was pointing out to me, indeed, we went over one of the new newly constructed bridges. So, so yes, it's very visible, uh, the infrastructure uh, rollout. You can obviously see it in the, in the data, in the roads and, and the railways, the port infrastructure, the power infrastructure. But you know, it's nothing like seeing it yourself firsthand. Okay. Jonathan, you have a good stay here and I'm sure that the rain gods are going to be hopeful and trust me, yes, you did get that respite given that you just came two days back to Mumbai. But good chatting with you. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> yes, thank you for having me. If you like this video, then like, share and subscribe to 18 Now.